Let us all join together in prayer. Father, we know that the very air which we breathe is just full of messages and music which men are putting out over radio waves. But we realize, too, that all around us there are supernatural things happening which we may be equally unaware of until your Holy Spirit tunes us in. We pray that we may be able to hear more than human words this morning. We pray that we may hear your voice speaking to us. We ask that you will deliver us from just saying prayers. Lord, teach us to pray. We ask that as we bring our praise in song, and as we sing about your love and your grace, that that praise may not just be an activity of our minds, but may spring from the depths of our hearts and may reach to highest heaven. <clears throat> we pray now, O oh God, that all that we seek to do this day may be utterly real and utterly sincere, that our worship may be in spirit and in truth and may be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, now I'd like to begin by recapping what we talked about last Sunday morning so that we can go on from what we were discussing then. But I'd be very grateful if a steward could bring a glass of water to the pulpit. Uh, I've got a bad throat today. Could you just bring one up? Thank you. Now, last Sunday morning we were talking about John chapter 14 to chapter 16. And we were discussing what our Lord said on the night before he died. <clears throat> and we discovered then that one of the main things he talked about was the Holy Spirit. And he did this because he was leaving them and he was going to send another. Now the two words, another comforter, we looked at quite a lot. And I tried to show you that the word comforter is a very strong and powerful word. It doesn't mean someone who soothes you and somebody who makes you nice and comfortable. And indeed, no churches ever since have sought to do that from the shape of their pews or the texture of them. You don't come here to be made comfortable or to be soothed. The word comfort means to be made a fortress. Literally, to be made a fort, to be made terribly strong, to be sent into battle, invincible to be able to face the foe unafraid and to be able to face whatever life may bring and be more than conquerors. But the word paraclete, which was a word I introduced you to last Sunday, which in fact you've been singing about in that hymn number 230, I don't know if you noticed it, twice you prayed about the paraclete. This word means somebody whom you call to stand by your side. Somebody you want to be with you in the crisis. Somebody you want to be there so that with him there you feel you can face anything. <clears throat> now then, I then spoke about the word another, and if someone hasn't taken my hymn books, I'm afraid they have, so I can't do it again this morning. But if I had two different hymn books, and I was saying here is one hymn book, here is another, this one is blue, this one is black, I would use a Greek word, heteros, which means another one of a different kind. But if, on the other hand, I'm able to use another blue one, it's not the same size, but it, uh, it looks the same. If I'm saying this is another hymn book that is blue like this one, just the same, I would use a special Greek word, alos, which means another one of exactly the same kind. And when Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit, he said, I will send you another comforter, Alos, which means another person just like me, which prompted the schoolboy to say that the Holy Spirit was Jesus' other self, which is about the de best definition I've ever come across. Now, if what we have been saying is right, and the Holy Spirit is another strengthener, another standby, another person you'd have, like to have with you in the crisis, 
just like Jesus, then two things follow which are very important. Here is the first. The personality of the Holy Spirit. Never, never, never talk of the Holy Spirit as it. You'd be amazed how often that's done in prayer or in speaking. And people say, give it to us. Never do that. If the Holy Spirit is another comforter like Jesus, the Holy Spirit is he, a full personality, someone who can think, someone who can feel, someone who can guide, someone who can teach, someone who can lead, someone who can speak, someone who can be grieved, someone who can be angry, someone who can be upset, someone who can be to you all that Jesus was. Now it's very interesting that when you come to what we call the sects who claim to have the truth and who claim to be the only ones to have it, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, Mormons, Spiritism, and so on, you will discover a most remarkable thing. Every one of these sects refers to the Holy Spirit as it. A kind of force, a kind of atmosphere, a kind of impersonal it in the middle of the people of God. And straight away one looks at this and one sees you've got it all wrong. You've misunderstood what Jesus said. He said, I'm going to pray the Father and he will give you another comforter just like me. And therefore he is a person, someone you can know as you know a person, someone indeed you can talk to. Excuse me. <clears throat> With all the water around today, to be thirsty in the pulpit is unusual. Well, now, this is the first thing that follows from the word another, the personality of the Holy Spirit, he, he. Now, you see the difference between saying these two things. If somebody goes away from a, a service or a meeting and says, there was a nice spirit in the meeting, they will invariably spell spirit with a small s, and they will not say the spirit, and they will not say he. They'll just say a spirit. There was a nice spirit or a good spirit. But somebody who goes away from a service or a meeting in which the Holy Spirit has been present, they will talk differently. They'll say, wasn't the Spirit there this morning? Wasn't he there this morning? Didn't he help us to worship? Didn't he tell us new truth? That is how they will talk if they understand the Holy Spirit. Now, the other thing that follows, if the Holy Spirit is another comforter like Jesus, not only his personality, but his deity, his deity, he must be God. Now, we know that Jesus was God. It took three years for people to find that out. But it was a very doubtful scientific skeptic who said to Jesus, to a man he lived with for three years, my Lord and my God. Therefore, for the first time in their lives, those Jews realized that God was more than one, that he must be two, and they called Jesus God, and they worshipped Jesus, and they prayed to Jesus. You should never pray to a human being. You should never pray or worship at a human being, but they worshipped Jesus, and they prayed to him. But the third step to which they came, and this led to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, is this. The Holy Spirit, if he's another comforter, just like Jesus, must be divine. He must be God. And therefore you can worship him. And therefore you can pray to him. And therefore you can praise him. And this you have done already this morning, whether you realized it or not. You sang a hymn to the Holy Spirit, and he was listening. You praised him, you prayed to him, and you asked him to do something for you, which would be utterly wrong if he was not God and not divine. And so Christians are left shut up with a belief in three people, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of whom are people, 
all of whom are personalities with hearts, minds, and will, all of whom can be grieved and can be angry, all of whom love you, all of whom have compassion for you, and all of whom are God. And therefore we say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise all three quite freely. And if you go to the Church of England, for example, frequently you will say these words, <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, world without end. Amen. This is what you say because of the three. Now, all that's by way of introduction to this morning's subject. Because now I want to go back to John's Gospel, and if you've got your Bible, open it at John chapters 14 to 16. Our Lord is going to die within 24 hours. <clears throat> what a man says in his last day of life is usually very significant and quite memorable. And in these chapters we have the longest discourse recorded of our Lord's words in the whole of the Bible. I don't know if you realize, but in the whole of the New Testament, we've only got about six hours of our Lord's teaching. The Son of God must have said many, many wonderful things. If they had all been written down, the world could not contain the books. We've only got six hours. And you could sit down and you could read aloud everything our Lord said in six hours flat. If you don't believe me, you try it. It would be a very useful thing for you to do and a very healthy exercise. But in that six hours, the longest discourse we have is this one on the night before he died. It's even longer than the Sermon on the Mount, which is the second longest. And if you really want the teaching of Jesus, you've got to go to these chapters. People sometimes say to me, if everybody lived up to the Sermon on the Mount, that would be all we'd need. I agree entirely. I just haven't yet met anyone who could live out the Sermon on the Mount. That's the one snag. How are we ever going to live up to the standards of the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus held before us? The answer lies in the last sermon he preached. If the Sermon on the Mount is the first recorded sermon, then this is the last recorded sermon. And if you read the standards of the Sermon on the Mount and say, how can I ever reach that? The answer lies in the last sermon by the Holy Spirit. The heart of the Sermon on the Mount, many people say, is in the positive command, do unto others as you would have them do to you. That's fine. But if I stopped and asked you, how many of you have lived like that, even just during the last week? It would be very difficult to put up our hands with confidence. How many of you have given your neighbors as much attention as you would wish to receive? How many of you have given those lonely people down the road as much friendship as you would wish to have if you were alone? How many other hungry people in the world have you thought of as often as you would wish that you would think of them if you were there and they were you? There isn't one of us in this church could say, I have done what the Sermon on the Mount tells me to do in full. How will we ever get there? The answer is we need another comforter, we need another standby, we need somebody else to come and help us. And this is what our Lord spoke about in the last night of his life. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are identical in character. To meet one is to meet the lot. Sometimes when you meet a husband and wife, you know they've grown so much together through having meals, sitting opposite each other for years, through looking into each other's face for years, and you, you grow like each other because your facial expression is more important than your features after the age of 40. And you tend to pick up the expression of the one you look at all the time, which is why we should look unto Jesus all the time and why we will begin to reflect him. But to meet some couples, to meet one is to meet the other. And you feel that if you asked one what the other would think, they'd be able to tell you. And indeed they frequently do. And sometimes you'll find if you ring my wife up, she will 
uh, be able to tell you what I might think about something that you're inquiring about. And she'll say, well, I think my husband would do so-and-so. She's probably right with her feminine intuition. I can't do it as easily the other way. But uh, with her intuition, she can. And with couples who are very close together, to meet one is to meet the other. To hear what one thinks is to know what the other will think. To have the reaction of one is to know the reaction of the other. Now, in exactly the same way with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if you get to know the Father, you'll get to know the Son. And vice versa, if you get to know the Son, you'll get to know the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. It is just as true about the Holy Spirit. If you get to know the Holy Spirit, you'll get to know Jesus better. And you'll get to know God better. Because they all think alike, they all speak alike, they all say the same things, they all have the same feelings towards you. If one is grieved by something you've done, the whole lot of them will be grieved. If one tells you to do a thing, the other two will agree that that is the right thing to do. They are one. And in John chapter 17, a prayer that Jesus prayed at the end of this discourse, he prays to his Father and he says, Father, I am in you, you're in me, I just say the things you want me to say, I just do your will. We're just one. And it's lovely when two people can be as close as this so close that I don't think any relationship on earth could be as close. But having said all that, that Father, Son, and Spirit are so united, so identical in character and outlook and feelings, may I now say that they have different work to do. And each of them gets on with that work in his own way. The Father has work to do, and he does it. The Son has work to do, and he does that. The Spirit has work to do, and he does that. And this work is different. I think I've told you before of the three men walking along the street, and all three pointing to one house and saying, That is my house. And all three were right in different ways, because the first man was the man who was the architect and builder, and he built it. The second man was the man who bought it from the builder, and he became the landlord. And the third man was the tenant living in that house and paying rent for it. And they were all three right in saying, that is my house. But towards the house, each of them had a different function, a different kind of work to do. One made it, one bought it, one lived in it. And at a very simple level, you may say that these three are the functions of the persons of the Godhead. The Father made you. He made the universe and he still runs it. The Son bought you at a terrible price, but he bought you. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. And he's the tenant. And they all look at each one of God's children and they say, he's mine, she's mine, and they're all right. But we can go a little further than that. You can take it in relation to a will. When somebody dies and leaves a will, certain things need to happen. And you can say that God the Father was the one who originally thought of making the will. God the Son was the one who died to make it effective. And however much your wealthy uncle in America has left you, you won't get a penny till he dies. And God the Son was the one who died to make it effective. And God the Holy Spirit is the executor of the will, whose job it is to see that you get what was left to you. Jesus had nothing to leave of property. He had no house. His clothes were going to be ripped off his back, so he couldn't even leave his best coat. It was going to be gambled for by the soldiers who pinned him to the cross. He had nothing to leave. He was a bit like John Wesley. John Wesley, the 18th century revivalist, was sent a letter by the capital gains tax authorities, even in those days, and they said, list all your goods. We gather you have a very large income of thousands of pounds a year, and we want to have a list of all that you have. And he wrote back seven silver teaspoons in London and five more silver teaspoons in Bristol. 
and he was in trouble with the authorities for being facetious, but that is all he had. All the thousands of pounds he'd received, he'd given away. He'd given to orphanages, he'd given for libraries, he'd given for clinics. He'd given it away for the good of his fellow men, and he just had a dozen silver teaspoons. Our Lord was even poorer than that, and the Lord had nothing to leave except one thing. He said, my peace I leave with you, that's my will. And he wrote his last will and testament this night, and he said, my peace I leave. Now, you don't get peace. You don't get anything until the person who left you it in the will dies. And Jesus died. And now peace became possible. But it was the executor we call the Holy Spirit who came to bring that peace to men and said, now you can have it. And if you don't have the peace that passes understanding, if you don't have the peace of God, then it's because you haven't been in touch with the executor. You have a right to have it. God willed it, Jesus died to make it effective, and the Holy Spirit is the executor. And that's why we say the fruit of the Spirit is peace. Now, in John chapter 14 to 16, Jesus divides the function, the work of the Holy Spirit, into three parts. His work in relation to Jesus, his work in relation to the disciples, and his work in relation to the world. And these are the three main things I want to talk about now. What the Holy Spirit does for Jesus, what the Holy Spirit does for you, the believers, the disciples, what the Holy Spirit does for the world outside who doesn't think about him. First of all, then, his work in relation to Jesus. I was talking this week to a promotion and advertising consultant what a fine art this has been reduced to. Analysis of market, very detailed study of the people you're wanting to contact and how best to touch their springs of generosity. It's been reduced to a fine art now, and it's become a science. I hope you won't think me blasphemous if I say that the Holy Spirit was given to be the publicity agent for Jesus to be the one to draw him to other people's attention, to sell him to people. Now, if that's using blunt language, let me go to scriptural language and see what Jesus says. Jesus says here, when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will glorify me. He will take my things and make them real to you. He'll make people think about me. He will publicize me. Now, I'm quite sure that everybody in this church has heard the name Billy Graham. But I'm going to ask you to put up your hands if you've heard the name Jerry Bevan. Would you just put your hand up if you've heard of Jerry Bevan? Not more than a couple of dozen of you. One upstairs. Now, this is very interesting. You would never have heard of the name Billy Graham in the first instance, but for Jerry Bevan. Jerry Bevan was the publicity agent for the Billy Graham organization before Haringey. And he came over about 12 months before Haringey Crusade, and his job was to let people in England know that Billy was coming for a crusade at Haringey, so that by the time it started, Everybody within reach would know about it. And I think he did such a good job that just about everybody within 20 miles of Haringey knew that Billy Graham was coming. Now, Jerry Bevan is a delightful Christian. He's a most self-effacing man. He's utterly content to draw attention to someone else, to prepare the way for someone else, and then to stand back and let the Lord use that publicity. Now, without in any way suggesting a parallel, it would be blasphemous to do so, and Billy would be the first to say, don't draw that parallel. I'm going, nevertheless, to use that as an illustration of the Holy Spirit in relation to Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit's function to publicize Jesus, to glorify Jesus, to get people talking about Jesus, to draw people's attention to Jesus, and it's the Holy Spirit who is behind every publicity of Jesus. 
You cannot publicize Jesus without the Holy Spirit. You can publicize the church, you can publicize a minister. You will find it embarrassing and impossible to publicize Jesus without the Holy Spirit. You'll be able to talk about Commercial Road Baptist Church or even about that funny man in the pulpit. But you try talking about Jesus without the publicity agent, without the Holy Spirit. Let me draw something else from this. He will glorify Jesus. One of the marks of being filled with the Holy Spirit is not that you talk about the Holy Spirit. You will talk about Jesus much more. And I have noticed again and again and again, when people get filled with the Spirit, they start using just this name Jesus much more frequently, much more openly, much more frankly. And they don't say Jesus Christ, and they don't say the Lord Jesus Christ, they just say Jesus much more. And it's because the Holy Spirit in them is now going to make them a publicity agent for Jesus so that this name is on everyone's lips and this name is widely known and everybody knows that Jesus is coming one day and is getting ready for him. You'll not find this apart from the Holy Spirit. You'll never hear people saying Jesus is coming except through the Holy Ghost. It's something you don't talk about until you're in the grip of this publicity agent. He will glorify me. And so those who talk a great deal about being filled with the Holy Spirit can sometimes be denying that they are for the very fact that they are not talking about the right person. Sometimes churches have been divided over the Holy Spirit. That's a tragedy when it happens. And I've been asked more than once to go to such a church as a kind of consultant to try and help them to get over the problems. And I first of all got hold of those within the church who have claimed to be filled with the Holy Ghost and I've said to them very frankly, who have you been talking about in the fellowship, the second or the third person of the Trinity? Have you been talking about Jesus or the Holy Ghost? And invariably when trouble has come, it is because they've been talking about the Holy Ghost instead of about Jesus. And I've said no one in a church can ever object to someone who talks more about Jesus. So you use the power of the Holy Ghost to publicize Jesus. That's what he was given for you to do. He is a most self-effacing person of the Trinity. He doesn't want you to talk about him. He wants you to talk about Jesus. So this is the first work of the Holy Spirit in John 14 to 16. He will take my words, he will take my things, he will take me and make me real to, to you. He will glorify me, not himself. He will draw attention to me, he will publicize me. And one of the marks of the coming of the Holy Ghost to a church is that they talk about Jesus, <coughs> not the <coughs> church or the minister, or the new building, or things like this. These have their place, and they are part of normal discussion, and we mustn't exclude them. But anybody can talk about a building. You don't need to be filled with the Holy Ghost to say we're going to put up a new building in Millmead. Anybody could do that. The builders can do that when they're busy. Anybody can do that. But to say we're putting up that new building in Millmead because we love Jesus... That needs the Holy Ghost to talk like that. He will glorify me. Now the second work of the Holy Ghost in relation to the disciples. And here I notice something very striking. That the Holy Spirit is more concerned with our mind than our heart. With our thoughts than our feelings. And yet again and again I've come up against people who think that to be filled with the Holy Ghost is primarily an emotional or ecstatic experience and giving you wonderful bubbly feelings inside. That's how one young lady described it to me, or at least she was still seeking. And she said, how will I know when I'm filled with the Holy Ghost? Will I get a nice bubbly feeling inside me? Well, that may well come, but Jesus never promised it, and it wouldn't worry me if it didn't come. 
The Holy Ghost is much more concerned that we think right rather than we feel right. That's a very important thing. And again and again in John 14 to 16, this comes out. He is described three times in John chapter 14, verse 17, chapter 15, verse 26, chapter 16, verse 13, as the spirit of truth. And truth is what your mind understands. Truth is what you think about. Truth is what is real and what is true and right. And he is called the spirit of truth because when he comes to a man, that man knows what is true, what is right. The world in which we live is a world packed with lies. That may sound a strong statement, but it's packed with lies. Lies about God, lies about men, lies about the world in which we live, lies about the past, lies about the future. There are articles appearing in our public press and on our television screens. Things are appearing about Jesus, which are lies. The recent play Son of Man on the BBC television is a lie about Jesus. It's not true. He is not like that. He's not a bungling peasant. He's the son of God. And he isn't dead. He rose from the dead. And we're living in a world full of lies about Jesus and about God. There's a lie going about that God won't punish sin. That's a lie. It's not true. Now the spirit of truth when he comes to a believer. The spirit of truth brings truth. A man knows what God is really like. A man knows what Jesus is really like. A man knows that God must punish sin, but he'll also know that God pardons sin and that he's a God of mercy as well as justice. He will know the truth about himself, and there are not many of us who like that. To be able to know what you really like in God's sight is a devastating thing. But to know yourself, the ancient Greeks said, is the beginning of wisdom. And so in a world full of lies, the Spirit comes as the Spirit of truth. And he says, I'll tell you what's true. I will bring you into all truth. When Jesus was on earth, he could only introduce his disciples to a little bit of the truth. There were many things that they couldn't understand at that stage. There were many things they couldn't believe. And so he said, I have many more things I would love to have told you but I can't tell them to you now. You wouldn't understand them anyway. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will lead you into all truth. All truth. Truth about the past, he will bring everything I've said to your remembrance. I've listened to scholars who've said these books were written 10, 20, 30, 40 years afterwards. How do we know they remembered what Jesus said accurately? The answer is very simple. The spirit of truth will bring to your remembrance everything I've said. Truth about the present, truth about the future. How do we know how the world is going to end? How do we know what's going to happen at the end of history? How do we know the future? Do we consult a horoscope? Do we gaze into the crystal ball? Do we listen to the political pundits? How do we know? The answer is the spirit of truth shows everything and we have written in this Bible an account of the future with everything you need to know about the end of the world and the beginning of a new one. And it was the Holy Spirit who did this. Now, Jesus said the spirit of truth will bring you into the past truth, the present truth, the future truth. The gospels are the past truth brought to their remembrance. The epistles are the present truth for them in their church life. And the book of Revelation is the future truth, and that pretty well covers it, and that's the New Testament. It's all the truth about the past, the present, and the future of Jesus. And the spirit of truth brought this book into being. It's not the production of a bunch of men who thought they'd write down their thoughts. It's the production of the Holy Ghost, and that's why it's all truth. Well, that's his function in relation to the believer in relation to Jesus, he publicizes, glorifies Jesus. In relation to the believer, he is the teacher. I don't care how often you come to 
this church, how often I speak to you or how long I speak to you. I can't teach you a thing about God. Not a thing. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Otherwise, between here and the bus stop, you will forget what I've said. Unless the Holy Spirit teaches on Sunday mornings, I'm wasting my time. I can't convince you that a thing is true. You'll say, well, that's your opinion. I'm entitled to mine. I can't convince you. And I'm not here to convince you. But there's a better teacher than I am. That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus has been <coughs> said to be the best teacher <coughs> there has ever been. The best teacher of all. His method, his approach. Do you know that I read a book recently on modern educational method? The very latest thing. How to teach children today. And when I read that book, I said, you know, there's nothing new in this. You'll find everything this book says in the Gospels. Make it visual. Start with something in their experience. Build on that. You go through modern educational theory. Everything that is good in it you'll find in the Gospel story. Jesus used the method. He didn't use the initial teaching alphabet with those rather weird 40 characters, but I would predict that in another 10 years that may well be dropped. I gather in some schools it's on the way out already. Everything that is lasting of insight into proper educational theory you will find you can illustrate from the ministry of Jesus. Object lessons, he's always doing that. Now then, what I'm going to say is this, if the Holy Spirit is another comforter like Jesus, you would expect him to be a great teacher. I'm going to tell you now about a young man who's building motorways in the Midlands. He was a pilot officer in the Royal Air Force when I was a chaplain out in Aden. And I remember Trevor sitting one night on a deck chair with me outside the officer's mess in the blistering heat of the desert. We were just talking together. And he told me, frankly, he wasn't interested in religion, but we talked together and we looked up at the stars and somehow when you're all alone and looking up at the stars and the desert stretches before you into infinity, it's easier to think big. And so we talked about God and I gave him a little book to read about God and he came back and said, that's interesting and finally started coming to the little hut where we had our church. And then one night Trevor came to know Jesus Christ. And he was soundly converted. But after the service, when I was talking to him, he said to me, Padre, he said, I've got to leave tomorrow. I've been posted up into one of the desert outposts for six months with 15 men. So the day after he was born again of the Spirit, he was cut off from Christian fellowship for six months. So I told him straight away about the other comforter who would go with him into the desert and who would teach him the things that he couldn't come to church to learn. And off he went. Three weeks later, I had a letter from him which said this. It came down with the air stage that week and the letter said, I have led my Batman to Christ. So there are now two of us meeting and worshipping on this camp. So it went on. For six months he had no one to teach him. For six months he had no one to take him through the Bible, as I'm able to take you through on Sunday mornings. For six months he had nobody to help him but the Holy Spirit, but that was enough. The Holy Spirit undertook for him in that situation. So now Trevor is building motorways and preaching round the Midlands and leading people to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit taught him if ever you find things difficult to understand, ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Before you read this book, don't try and read it on your own. Say, Holy Spirit, you wrote this. Then now read it and teach it to me. Why is it that the same group of people can sit in the same building, listening to the same preacher, and two people sitting next to each other can go out and one can say, well, I got nothing at all this morning and I didn't understand what he was on about. 
which does happen quite frequently, and somebody else sitting next door to them can go out and say, well, I really learned something this morning that I never knew before, and I shall be able to live by that. Why is it? I'll tell you. One has the Holy Spirit and the other doesn't. One has a teacher in his heart that is able to take the word that I am reading and speaking about and plant it deep down in the soil of the heart where it germinates and during the week something will happen, something will grow and something very practical will result. There's a young lady who may be here this morning and she's given me permission to tell you but do you remember a few weeks ago when I mentioned that it is perfectly all right to ask for a rise in pay at your work if your motives are right in asking for it? And I mentioned a lady who listened to me preach once and she'd never had a rise in 12 years but her giving to the Lord was getting squeezed by the cost of living rise and so she went home after I'd said pray for a rise and she did. She prayed for a rise and she got one the following morning at 11.30 for the first time in 12 years was able to give more to the Lord. I mentioned this a few months ago. <clears throat> one person in the congregation, to my knowledge, there may have been more, one person went home and tried it out. One person said, I'll take that at, at face value. And though they normally only got a pay rise in January, they got one in April and were able to give something to the new building fund. That's the commercial for that. <laughs> But why is it that out of a large crowd, one person will take a word from God and say, I'm going to put that to the test, I'm going to try it, I'm going to live, live that way. And they go out and they discover it to be true. The answer is the Holy Ghost was teaching them and saying something to them. Now finally, the Holy Ghost's ministry to the world, to the people outside the church, the Holy Spirit, what can he do for them? Those people who are not in church this morning, they're at the coast, they're having a grand time, they're enjoying God's Son, though they wouldn't call it that. They're having happiness with their families, they're gardening, they're lying in bed still maybe. What can the Holy Ghost do for them? Well, first of all, Jesus says in John 14, verse 16, quite bluntly, he says, they cannot receive the Holy Spirit. They cannot have him. They cannot be indwelt by him. They cannot have this comforter. They cannot have this strengthening. They cannot have this fortress experience. They can't have that. They cannot receive him. It's as simple as that. And the tragedy is that these people, when they come to the crisis, when they find themselves in the battle, when they find themselves in the heat of it, they must face that alone without the blessed comforter to stand by them. That draws out our compassion and our pity. To live without the Holy Ghost must be miserable. But what can he do for them? Verse 8 of chapter 16 is the key verse now. And when he comes, he will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now if ever you need the Holy Spirit to understand the word of God, you'll need it now. Him, now. You'll need his teaching. There are three things that are true which you will never convince anyone else are true without the Holy Ghost. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's break that down. You can convince people of vice and of crime, but not of sin. You can convince them of vice if they have vices. You can convince them of crime if they've broken the laws but to convince them of sin is impossible. You've tried, I've tried. We've said to somebody, you're a sinner. They've either slapped our face, our face or given us the cold shoulder, or they've said, I never did anybody any harm in my life. 
Fancy saying that. I found the best thing to say to a person who says that to me, I've never done anybody any harm, is to say, I wish I could say that. And that's true. No Christian could ever say that because they've been convinced of sin. Now, what's the difference? Well, vice is what you do against yourself. Crime is what you do against others. Sin is what you've done against God. And it's amazing that people without any vices and without any crimes in their life, and that's possible, don't realize that that doesn't mean they're not sinners. They may be thorough, thoroughly respectable, thoroughly good-living, decent, hard-working folk, and yet they're sinners in God's sight. Why? Well, do you know what the worst sin of all is? Murder? Adultery? What do you think the worst sin is? Drug taking? You'd think that was the way some people talk. What's the worst sin? Because they do not believe in me. Do you know what the worst thing you can ever do is? It's not to believe in Jesus. It's to throw God's love back in his face and say, God, I don't really care. God, did you send your son to the earth for me? I don't care. I can manage without him. Not to believe in me, that's the greatest sin of all. And to think of the millions in England who've heard about Jesus and who don't believe in him. Now, you'll never convince anybody that's a sin. You'll never convince your nice neighbors who are so kind to you when you're in trouble. It's hard enough to convince yourself the sinners sometimes, isn't it? Only the Holy Spirit can convince you that awfully nice neighbor you've got is a sinner needing a savior. And only the Holy Spirit can convince them. Sin is the first thing a person needs to be convinced about if they're going to come to the Savior. What comfort can a Savior bring to those who never felt their woe, says the hymn. And if you don't believe you're a sinner, you'll never believe in a Savior. Because you don't need one. And if your teeth don't ache, you won't go to the dentist. And if you haven't got any pains or any symptoms, you won't go to the doctor. And if you don't think you've got any sins, you won't come to Jesus. The second thing that you need to be convinced of is righteousness. That there is such a thing as perfect goodness. And that it is by that standard that your sin will appear at its most clear. Now again, you try convincing a person that there is such a thing as absolute goodness. I was in a group in a home recently. Some of you were there too, so you'll remember it. When a man quite seriously put forward the theory that God was not perfect, that he had his faults like everybody else. Now that is a blasphemy, and certainly a libel on God. How can you convince people that there is such a thing as perfect goodness? Why people say, and I remember a hairdresser saying this to me while we were chatting, he said, no one's perfect, no one's perfect. Ah, but there is someone who's perfect. There is. And it's not just a God in heaven who's perfect. There was once a man on earth who was absolutely perfect and who was accepted by God to heaven because he was. Of righteousness because I go to the Father, he's accepted me. And when you've convinced a man that he's a sinner and that Jesus was perfectly righteous, then something else follows, the third thing. What happens when badness meets perfect goodness? What happens when sin comes face to face with righteousness? The answer is judgment. Have you ever tried to convince a person that one day they'll stand naked before God and answer for every idle word they've uttered and every thought they've had and every feeling that passed through their minds? Have you ever tried to convince anyone that they're going to be judged for their whole life and that things they've forgotten for years will be brought up again? Have you ever tried to convince somebody that this is true? You never will. People today don't believe there's a judgment. They don't believe in hell. They don't believe in anything like that. How will we convince them? The answer is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convince the world, not the church, the world, of sin and righteousness and judgment. And when a man is convinced of those three things, he's ripe for the gospel.
He's ready for the Savior. He wants to know, how can I escape? How can I get out of this terrible dilemma? I'm a bad man. God's a perfectly good God, and when I meet him face to face, I shall have to run from him. How can I get out of this? Well, they're just ready to say to them, Jesus died for you. Jesus died that you might be forgiven. He died to make you good, that you might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. That's when the gospel comes in. And sometimes I think that in the church we have just half-converted people who've never been convinced of sin, never been convinced of righteousness, never been convinced of judgment, and therefore they never really love the Savior as they might. But when the day comes in your life when you tremble and you say, Oh God, I can't face you. I can't face the judgment. I'm not ready. I'm not good. I'm a sinner. Then God reaches down so tenderly and he lifts. And through Jesus Christ he saves. We're going to be baptizing people tonight in this water. Why? Because at some point in their life, the Holy Spirit convinced them of these three things and convinced them that Jesus can wash away all sin so that one day I stand clean and pure in God's sight on that great day. Let us pray. O oh, Holy Spirit, take my feeble words and make them the word of God. Plant them deep within our hearts. We thank you for your ministry of teaching, glorifying the Lord Jesus, introducing us to all the truth, convincing people who never thought they were sinners that they are, and that they must measure themselves not by the imperfections of others, but by the righteousness of Jesus, the utter goodness of our Lord and of judgment to come. O oh, Holy Spirit, fill us, cleanse us, renew us. Take us in our weakness and fill us with your power. Take us in our ignorance and fill us with truth. Take us in our sin and make Jesus real to us as our Savior. For his name's sake. Amen.